Hey everyone, this is a section from Anselm Yapa's Guy Debord, uh, part one, uh, the concept of the spectacle. The section that I'm reading is the spectacle, highest stage of abstraction. The concept of, quote, the society of the spectacle, end quote, is often taken to refer exclusively to the tyranny of the television and other such means of communication. For Debord, however, the, quote, mass media are but a, quote, limited aspect of the spectacle, quote, its most stultifying superficial manifestation, end quote. Invasion by the means of mass communication is only seemingly a deployment of instruments that, even when badly used, remain essentially neutral. In reality, the operation of the media perfectly expresses the entire society of which they are a part. The result is that direct experience and the determination of events by individuals themselves are replaced by a passive contemplation of images which have, moreover, been chosen by other people. This perception is at the heart of all Debord's thinking and action. In 1952, when Debord was 20 years old, he called for an art that would create situations rather than reproduce already existing situations. Five years later, Debord's founding platform for a Situationist International, SI, contained a first definition of the spectacle, quote, the construction of situations begins beyond the modern collapse of the notion of spectacle. It is easy to see how closely the very principle of the spectacle, namely non-intervention, is bound to the alienation of the old world, end quote. De Boer. The Twelve Issues of Internationale Situationiste, published from 1958 to 1969, attest to the increasing importance assumed by the notion of the spectacle in situationist thinking. Its systematic analysis, however, awaited the appearance in 1967 of the 221 theses that constitute de Boer's The Society of the Spectacle. Footnote. The ideas of the situationist are not identical in every regard to the ideas of Guy Debord, as Debord himself stressed in 1957 and again in 1985. For my present purposes, apart from books, shorter works, and articles signed by Debord, I have also taken into consideration, though to a lesser degree, the many unattributable articles in Internationale Situationiste. These expressed the collective opinions of the situationists, and it is unlikely in view of Debord's relationship to the organization that ideas not espoused by him would have been presented in this way as, quote, ideas of the group, end quote. On the other hand, all citations here to writing signed by other situationists are clearly identified as to their authors. End footnote. In contrast to the first stage of the historical development of alienation, which may be described as a downgrading of, quote, being into, quote, having, the spectacle is characterized by a subsequent downgrading of, quote, having into, quote, appearing. De Boer's analysis is based on the everyday experience of the impoverishment of life, life's fragmentation into more and more widely separated spheres, and the disappearance of any unitary aspect from society. The spectacle consists in the reunification of separate aspects at the level of the image. Everything life lacks is to be found within the spectacle, conceived of as an ensemble of independent representations. As an example here, De Boer evokes celebrities such as actors or politicians whose function it is to represent a combination of human qualities and of joie de vivre, precisely what is missing from the actual lives of all other individuals, trapped as they are in vapid roles. Quote, separation is the alpha and omega and omega of the spectacle, end quote. Section 25. And individuals, separated from one another, can rediscover unity only within the spectacle, where, quote, images detached from every aspect of life merge into a common stream, end quote. Individuals are reunited solely, quote, in their separateness, end quote, for the spectacle monopolizes all communication to the spectacle's own advantage and makes it only, it makes it one way only. The spectacle speaks, quote, social atoms, end quote, listen, and the message is one, capital O, one, an incessant justification of the existing society, which is to say the spectacle itself, or the modes of production that has given rise to the spectacle. For this purpose, the spectacle has no need of sophisticated arguments. All it needs is to be the only voice, and sure of no response whatsoever. It first per prerequisite, therefore, and at the time its chief product, is the passivity of a contemplative attitude. Only an individual, quote, isolated, end quote, amidst, quote, atomized masses, end quote, could feel any need for the spectacle, and consequently the spectacle must bend every effort to reinforce the individual's isolation. The spectacle has two main foundations, quote, incessant technological renewal, end quote, and the, quote, integration of state and economy, end quote. And in the spectacle's most recent phase, the spectacle has three main consequences, quote, generalized secrecy, unanswerable lies, and eternal present, end quote.
The spectacle is thus not a pure and simple adjunct to the world, as propaganda broadcast via the communications media might be said to be. Rather, the spectacle is the entirety of social activity that is appropriated by the spectacle for its own ends. From city planning to political parties of every tendency, from art to science, from everyday life to human passions and desires, everywhere we find reality replaced by images. In the process, images end up by becoming real. And reality ends up transformed into images. Such images, furthermore, are necessarily distorted, for if on the one hand the spectacle is society in its entirety, at the same time the spectacle is also a part of society as well as the instrument by means of which this part comes to dominate the whole. The spectacle does not reflect society overall. The spectacle organizes image in the interest of one portion of society only, and this cannot fail to affect the real social activity of those who merely contemplate these images. By subordinating everything to its own requirements, the spectacle is obliged to falsify reality to the point where, as Debor puts it, reversing Hegel's well-known proposition, quote, in a world that really has been turned on its head, truth is a moment of falsehood, end quote. Every power needs lies in order to govern, and the spectacle as the most highly developed power that has ever existed is correspondingly the most mendacious. All the more so, too, because the spectacle is the most superfluous and hence the least justifiable. The problem lies not, however, in the, quote, image or, quote, representation as such, as so many 20th century philosophies argue, but rather in the society that needs such images. It is true that the spectacle makes particular use of sight, quote, the most abstract of the senses and the most easily deceived, end quote. But the problem resides in the independence achieved by representations that have escaped from the control of human beings, proceeded to address proceed to address human beings in a monologue that eliminates all possible dialogue from human life. Such representations, though born of social practice, have, an inde have as independent beings. Excuse me. Such representations, though born of social practice, behave as independent beings. It will be evident by this time that this, the spectacle is the heir of religion, and... It is significant that the first chapter of the Society of the Spectacle has a quotation from Feuerbach's Essence of Christianity as its epigraph. The old religion projected man's own power into the heavens, where it took on the appearance of a god opposed to man, a foreign entity. The spectacle performs the same operation on earth. The greater the power that man attributed to gods of man's own creation, the more powerless man himself felt. Humanity behaves similarly with respect to powers that humanity has created and allowed to escape, and that now, quote, reveal themselves to us in their fullness, excuse me, in their full force, end quote. The contemplation of these powers is in inverse proportion to the individual's experience of real life, to the point where his most ordinary gestures are lived by someone else instead of by the subject himself. In this world, quote, the spectator feels at home everywhere, end quote. In the spectacle, as in religion, every moment of life, every idea, and every gesture achieves meaning only from without all of which implies neither a fatality nor the inevitable result of technological development. The split that has come about between real social activity and social activities representation real social activities representation is the consequence of splits within society itself is the most ancient of all separations that of power which has given rise to all the others beginning with the dissolution of the primitive community with beginning with the dissolution of primitive communities communities every society has experienced the establishment within that society's self of an institutional power a separate authority and all such power has a quote spectacular end quote dimension to it only with the advent of the modern era, however, has power been able to accumulate the adequate means, not only to extend its domination to every aspect of life, but also actively to mold society in accordance with its own requirements. It has achieved this thanks chiefly to a material production tending continually to recreate everything needed to promote isolation and separation, from automobiles to television. This, quote, spectacular, end quote, trend in capitalist development has imposed itself gradually, beginning in the 1920s and gaining enormously in strength after the Second World War, and it has continued to accelerate. In 1967, Debord ascribed the spectacle as, quote, the self-portrait of power in the age of power's totalitarian rule over the conditions of existence, end quote, and seemed to feel that an almost unsurpassable situation had been reached. In 1988, however, Debord acknowledged that the spectacle's grip over society in 1967, as seen from the benefit of 20 years' hindsight, had clearly not yet been perfected. 
The foregoing remarks do not apply solely to Western capitalist societies, for all modern socio-political systems pay tribute to the regime of the commodity and the spectacle. Just as the spectacle is a totality within society, so the spectacle is a totality on a world scale, you know, on a worldwide scale. A real antagonism, that between a proletariat demanding life and a system, quote, where the commodity contemplates the commodity self in a world of the commodity's own making, end quote. De Boer is concealed by spectacular spectacular antagonisms between political systems that are in actually, actuality mutually supportive. Such antagonisms, however, are not mere phantoms, for such antagonisms reflect the uneven development of capitalism in different parts of the world. Thus, alongside countries where the commodity has been able to develop freely, we have their pseudo-negation in the form of societies dominated by a state bureaucracy, such as the Soviet Union, China, or numerous third world nations. In 1967, de Boer classified such regimes, together with the fascist governments that arose in Western countries in periods of crisis, as instances of, quote, concentrated spectacular power, end quote. The relatively feeble economic development of these countries, as compared with that of societies ruled by, quote, diffuse spectacular power, end quote, is compensated for by ideology, which is the ultimate commodity. And the acme of ideology is the requirement that everyone identify with a leader, with a Stalin, a Mao, or a Sukarno. The spectacle in this concentrated form lacks flexibility, and the spectacle's rule depends in the end on police force. The spectacle's negative image nevertheless has a part to play in the, quote, worldwide division of spectacular tasks, end quote. For the Soviet bureaucracy and the Soviet bureaucracy's extensions in Western countries, i.e. the traditional Communist Party, stand in a loose in an illusory manner for resistance to diffuse spectacular power, spectacular power, inasmuch as no alternative to one or other of these forms appears to exist, real opponents within either spectacular system may often take the opposing system as their model, something that often happens, for example, in third world revolutionary movements. It was already clear to De Boer when he wrote The Society of the Spectacle that whatever Whichever version of the spectacle could offer the wider choice of commodities must eventually prevail. Each individual commodity promises access to a, quote, already questionable satisfaction allegedly derived from the consumption of the whole. The consumption of the whole, end quote. And as soon as the inevitable moment of dissolution occurs, another commodity appears that makes the same promise. In the struggle waged among various objects, a struggle in respect of which man is mere spectator, any given commodity, commodity is liable to wear itself out. Yet the spectacle as a whole merely gets stronger. As de Boer writes in one of the finest formulations in his book, quote, The spectacle is the epic poem of this strife, a strife that no fall of ilium can bring to an end, of arms in the man, the spectacle does not sing, but rather of passion and the commodity. End quote. Exchange value has become, to, excuse me, exchange value has come to dominate use value, and the detachment of the commodity from any genuine human need has succeeded, with the advent of patently useless objects in attaining a quasi-religious level. De Boer evokes the collecting of promotional key chains, which he characterizes as quote indulgences end quote of the commodity. What such an instance demonstrates is that the commodity no longer contains so much as an, quote, atom, end quote, of use value, but that the commodity henceforward is henceforwardable, consumable, qua commodity. Footnote. As early as the 1930s, Theodore W. Adorno asserted that hen henceforward exchange value could be consumed and use value exchanged, and that, quote, all enjoyments that achieves all enjoyment that achieves emancipation from exchange value thereby acquires subversive characteristics, end quote. End footnote. The spectacle is thus not bound to a particular economic system. Rather, the spectacle belongs to the victory of the category of the economy as such within society. The class responsible for the establishment of the spectacle, the bourgeoisie, owes its position of dominance to this triumph of the economy and the economy's laws over all aspects of life. The spectacle is, quote, both the outcome and the goal of the dominant mode of production, end quote. Quote, the omnipresent celebration of a choice already made in the sphere of production and the consummate result of that choice, end quote. De Boer. 
not just work, but likewise other sorts of human activity, what is known as, quote, free time, end quote, are organized in such a way as to justify and perpetuate the reigning mode of production. Economic production has been transformed from a means into an end, and the spectacular is its form of expression, with its, quote, essentially tautological, end quote, character. The spectacle's aim is simply the reproduction of the conditions of the spectacle's own existence. Instead of serving human desires, the economy, in the economy's spectacular stage, continually creates and manipulates needs that are all reducible to the single, quote, pseudo-need for the reign of an autonomous economy to continue, end quote. The, quote, economy, end quote, should therefore be understood here as one portion of global human activity that holds sway over all the rest. The spectacle is nothing more than this autocratic reign of the commodity economy. An economy becomes autonomous, excuse me, an economy become autonomous is in itself a form of alienation. Economic production is founded on alienation. Alienation has indeed become production's economic production's chief product. The economy's domination of the whole of society entails that maximum diffusion of alienation, which is precisely what constitutes the spectacle. Quote, the economy transforms the world, but the economy transforms the world into a world of the economy, end quote. De Boer. Clearly the term, quote, economy, end quote, is not being used here to mean simply material production, without which, of course, no society could exist. The economy in question is an economy that has become independent. Economy in question is an economy that has become independent and in so doing subjugated human life. This is a consequence of the triumph of the commodity within the prevailing mode of production. In the second chapter of the Society of the Spectacle, de Boer examines the steps whereby, quote, the entire economy then became what the commodity throughout this campaign of conquest had shown the commodity self to be, namely a process of quantitative development, end quote. De Boer. De Boer's account of the predominance of exchange value over use value does not depart significantly from Marx's, though De Boer's phraseology can be colorful. Quote, starting out as the condottiere of use value, exchange value ended up waging a war that was entirely use exchange value's own. End quote. De Boer. Footnote. De Boer was indeed so much taken with this formulation that he quoted himself 20 years later. End footnote. And whereas Marx evokes the law of the falling rate of profit, de Boer speaks of a, quote, falling rate of use value, which is a constant of the capitalist economy, end quote. An increasing subordination of all use, even the most banal, to the requirements of the growth of the economy to a sheerly quantitative criterion. For even though the progress of the economy may have solved the immediate problem of survival in part of the world, the question of survival in the larger sense continues to rear its head, because an abundance of commodities is nothing more than a shortage for which material provision has been made. In conceiving of alienation of the spectacle as a process of abstraction and accounting for it in terms of the commodity and the structure of the commodity, De Boer is elaborating upon some fundamental ideas of Marx's that not surprisingly have met with little success in the history of, quote, Marxism, end quote. For Hegel, alienation is constituted by the objective and sensible world inasmuch as the subject fails to recognize this world as his own creation. Quote, the young Hegelians, end quote, Feuerbach, Moses Hess, or the early Marx, likewise see alienation as an inversion of subject and attribute, of concrete and abstract, but their conception is the exact opposite of Hegel's in that the true subject for the young Hegelians is man in his sensual and material existence. Man is alienated when man becomes the attribute of an abstraction that man has himself posited but man no longer recognizes as such, and that thus appears to him to be a subject in its own right. Marx therefore comes to be determined by a now autonomous creation of his sorry, man therefore appears somewhere. Man, therefore, comes to be determined by a now autonomous creation of man's own. Feuerbach discerns alienation in the projection of human powers into the heaven of religion, leaving earthbound man powerless, but he also recognizes it in the abstraction of idealist philosophy, for which man in his material existence is merely a phenomenal form of the universal subject. Hess and the young Marx identify the state and money as two other fundamental alienations, as two abstractions in which man alienates himself and his capacities as a member of a collectivity and as a worker. This means by extension that the phenomenon of alienation does not affect quote, all, quote, humanity, end quote, to the same degree, 
but that a specific alienation weighs down on one part of it, namely that part which is obliged to work without possessing the means of production. The worker's product does not belong to the worker and thus appears to the worker as an alien and hostile force. In all forms of alienation, the concrete individual has value only inasmuch as the concrete individual partakes of the abstract, inasmuch as the concrete individual possesses wealth, is a citizen of a state, a man before God, or a, quote, self, end quote, in the philosophical sense. In this context, human action has no end of human action's own, and serves the sole purpose of permitting man to attain what man has already created himself, which, though conceived exclusively as a means, has been transformed into an end. Money is the most obvious example here. The spectacle is, in effect, the most highly developed form of this tendency towards abstraction, as witness to Bohr's observation that it its, quote, very manner of being concrete is precisely abstract, end quote. The devaluing of life to the benefit of hyperstatized abstractions now affects all aspects of existence, and these abstractions, which have now assumed the role of, Im of subjects, no longer appear as things, even more abstractly as images. The spectacle may be said to incorporate all older forms of alienation. De Boer describes the spectacle variously as the, quote, material reconstruction of the religious illusion, end quote. Quote, the material reconstruction of the religious illusion, end quote. As, quote, money for contemplation only. As, quote, money for contemplation only, end quote. As, quote, inseparable from the modern state, end quote. And as, quote, ideology in material form, end quote. Footnote. It is worth noting once again that the spectacle implies a continual reversing of thing and image. Things that were merely, quote, ideal, end quote, such as religion and philosophy, take on material form, while things that had a certain material reality, such as money in the state, are reduced to mere images. Footnote, excuse me, end footnote. The notion of alienation as the inversion of subject and attribute, and as the subordination of the, quote, essence of man, end quote, to what the essence produced, was superseded in Marx's thinking after a few years on the grounds that it was still too philosophical in character. In the Communist Manifesto of 1848, Marx and Engels poked fun at the, quote, German illiter excuse me, quote, German literati, end quote, because, quote, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote, quote, alienation in the essence of man, end quote, end quote. Marx and Engels. But the concept of alienation in the sense of abstraction comes back into play in Marx's later works on the critique of political economy, which in addition reveals the historical origins of the process of abstraction. In the first chapter of Volume 1 of Capital, Marx analyzes the form of the commodity as the core of all capitalist production and shows that the process of abstraction is at the heart of the modern economy, not simply an unpleasant side effect of it. It should be borne in mind that Marx is not yet speaking here of surplus value or of the selling of labor power or of capital. He thus sees all the most highly developed forms of the capitalist economy as deriving from this primal structure of the commodity, which he compares to the, quote, cell form, end quote, of the body, and from the antagonism between concrete and abstract, between quantity and quality, between production and consumption, and between the social relationship and what that relationship produces. Footnote. Marx preface to the first edition of Capital Volume 1. Another footnote. Consequently, nothing could be further from the truth than the claim of some commentators that Marx's reasons for starting out with the analysis of value was purely methodological ones, and that this analysis is meaningful only when viewed through the problem through the lens of the latter analysis of surplus value. Thus, Louis Yatusser counsels those reading Volume 1 of Capital for the first time to skip Part 1. And he makes no bones about his conviction that the pages on the fetishistic character of the commodity are harmful, a harmful residue of Hegelianism that has had an extremely pernicious effect on the development of what he considers to be Marxism. See, Preface to Capital, Volume 1, in Althusser, Lenin and Philosophy, and other essays, translated by Ben, ben Brewster. Monthly Review Press, 1971. End footnote. Marx stresses the dual character, the dual character of the commodity. Aside from the commodity's utility, the commodity's use value, the commodity also possesses a value that determines the relationship whereby the commodity is exchanged for other commodities, the commodity's exchange value. The material qualities of each commodity are necessarily distinct from those of other, all others, so that in this sense, commodities have no common measure. But at the same time, all commodities have a common substance which makes commodities exchangeable in that each possesses a different quantity thereof. 
This, quote, substance of value, end quote, is identified by Marx as the quantity of abstract labor time needed to produce a particular commodity. Qua exchange value, commodities have no specific qualities, and diverse commodities may be distinguished from one another only in a quantitative way. The value of a product is thus constituted not by the specific concrete labor that has created it, but by rather by abstract labor. Quote, with the disappearance of the useful character of the products of labor, the useful character of the kinds of labor embodied in those commodities also disappears. This in turn entails the disappearance of the different concrete forms of labor. They can no longer be distinguished, but are altogether reduced to the same kind of labor, human labor in the, ab in the abstract, end quote. Thus, the qualitative character of the different forms of labor that produce different products is lost. The value of a commodity is nothing more than a, quote, crystal of a, quote, substance, of, quote, homogenous human labor, end quote, which is merely, quote, an expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves, hands, etc., end quote, and the only measure of which is the time it takes to perform. The time in question is always that which is needed on average to manufacture a particular product in a given in society under given working conditions. More complicated jobs have a value that is simply a multiple of that of simpler ones, i.e. of a greater quantity of simpler labor. In the seemingly trite formula, 10 quote, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen, end quote, Marx recognizes that the most general formula for all capitalist production, excuse me, recognized the most general formula for all capitalist production. Two concrete things take the form of something else that connects those two concrete things, namely abstract labor, whose ultimate form is money. A commodity must nevertheless always have a use value and answer a need, whether real or artificial. A commodity's value always appears as a use value, which in the exchange process simply process is simply, quote, the bearer, end quote, of exchange value. To be realized, use value, use value must, quote, become the form of appearance of its opposite, value, end quote. The process thereby, whereby the concrete becomes abstract is here understood by Marx not in an anthropological sense, but as the consequence of a determinate historical phenomenon. The spread of the commodity is indeed a phenomenon of the modern period. The subordination of quality to quantity and of concrete to abstract is implicit in the structure of the commodity, but not all human activity is founded on exchange and hence on the commodity. One second, I've got to get some coffee. Ah. It is a beautiful day today. I am blessed by the Lord Almighty. Where am I? <sighs> okay. So long as different human communities, villages, for instance, continue to produce what those different human communities need for themselves, restricting exchange, restricting exchange to the role of an occasional way for dealing with surpluses, use value will determine production. Each particular job is part of a division of tasks within the community with which it is directly associated, and it thus retains its qualitative character. This is why Marx says that the social relation here is produced along with material production. Relations between men may be brutal in such circumstances, but they continue to be clearly recognizable for what they are, as for instance when serfs of the gleb or slaves realize that they are relieved of part of what they produce by their masters. Only when a certain threshold is passed in the development and volume of exchange does production itself come to be defined essentially in terms of the creation of exchange value. The use value of each product will thenceforth reside in its exchange value, and other use values will be reachable only through exchange value serving as intermediary. Labor itself becomes labor power to be sold for the purpose of performing abstract labor. Access to use value, which is to say access to the concrete, is possible only via the mediation of exchange value, or, or more specifically, of money. In modern society, individuals are isolated within a production system where everyone produces according to their self-interest. The social links between such individuals are established only a posteriori thanks to the exchange of commodities. Their concrete being or subjectivity is perforce alienated in the mediation of abstract labor, which erases all differences. The capitalist mode of production entails the extension 
of the characteristics of the commodity to the entirety of material production and to the entirety of social relations. Men merely exchange units of abstract labor, objectified as exchange value, which can then be reconverted into use value. The value of products is created by men, but unbeknownst to them. The fact that value always appears in the shape of a use value of a concrete object gives rise to the illusion that a product's concrete characteristics are what determine that commodity's, me, that product's fate. Footnote. If, quote, one ton of iron and two ounces of gold, end quote, have the same market value, common sense suggests that a natural relationship exists here. In reality, the relationship concerned is between the quantities of labor that have produced the one and the other. End footnote. Herein lies the famous, quote, fetishism of the commodity and its secret, end quote, in discussing which Marx makes an explicit comparison to the religious illusion where the products of human fancy appear to take on a life of their own. In a society where individuals encounter one another solely through exchange, the transformation of the products of human labor and of the relations that preside over it to something apparently, quote, natural, end quote, further implies that the whole of social life seems to be independent of human volition and that it manifests itself as a seemingly autonomous, end quote, given, end quote, entity that is subject to no rules but its own. Indeed, in Marx's view, such relations, such social relations do not merely appear but actually are, quote, material relations between persons and social relations between things, end quote. On those rare occasions when the Marxist tradition has addressed the issue of, quote, commodity fetishism, end quote, it has almost always treated it as a phenomenon strictly confined to the sphere of consciousness, that is to say, as a false idea of the, quote, real, end quote, economic situation. But this is but one aspect of the matter. As Marx himself cautions, quote, the belated scientific discovery that the products of labor, insofar as the products of labor are values, are merely the material expressions of the human labor expended to produce them, marks an epoch in the history of mankind's development, but by no means banishes the semblance of objectivity possessed by the so-called character characteristics of labor, excuse me, by the social characteristics of labor, excuse me. In point of fact, the concept of, quote, fetishism, end quote, implies that the whole of human life is subordinated to the laws dictated by the nature of value, and in the first place to the necessity for value to increase continually. The abstract labor embodied in commodities is utterly indifferent to whatever effects it may have on the plane of use. Its aim is purely and simply to have produced a greater quantity of value in the form of money by the end of its cycle than it had at the beginning. Footnote. With interest-bearing capital, that is to say, with, quote, money that produces more money, end quote, the tautologist character of the production of value achieves its clearest expression. Money, money prime, or money more money. Here we have the original starting point of capital, money in the formula money purchasing commodity, commodities, which is then sold for more money, reduced to the two extremes, money, more money, where more money equals money plus an increment, plus an augmented uh, quantity of money, money that creates more money. This is the original and general formula for capital reduced to an absurd abbreviation, end quote. Marx. End footnote. Where's the footnote at? Uh, this means that in the dual character of the commodity, it is already possible to discern capitalism's most fundamental trait, namely the necessity for the system to be in a permanent state of crisis. Far from being a, quote, neutral, end quote, factor, as the Marxists of the workers' movement tended to believe, which only becomes problematic in the context of the extraction of, quote, surplus value, end quote, i.e. exploitation, value leads, on the contrary, to an ineluctable clash between, quote, economic, end quote, rationality on the one hand, entailing the creation of more and more value irrespective of concrete content and real human needs on the other. From the point of view of value, the trafficking of plutonium or contaminated blood is worth more than French agriculture. There is nothing aberrant about this. It is simply the working of the logic of value. Footnote. In the German journal Crisis, number 13, published in 1993, one of the few publications to have elaborated upon these arguments in recent years, Ernst Lohoff writes as follows, quote, The contemplative and affirmative tone with which Hegel has reality evolve from the starting point of the concept of, quote, being, end quote, is utterly foreign to the Marxian account of value. For Marx, quote, value, end quote, cannot embody reality, but value subordinates reality to value's own form, which form, 
Value then destroys, and in so doing, destroys itself. The Marxian critique of value does not accept value as a positive basic concept, nor does the Marxian critique of value argue in its name, in value's name. The Marxian critique of value interprets its self-sufficient existence in terms of appearance. Uh, the Marxian critique of value interprets value's self-sufficient existence in terms of appearance. And indeed, the large-scale construction of the mediation known as the commodity absolutely does not lead to any definitive triumph of that form, but coincides instead with its crisis, end quote. Ernst Lohoff. End footnote. Clearly, value is in no sense a, quote, economic, end quote, category. Rather, value is a complete social form that itself causes the splitting of society into different sectors, nor therefore is the, quote, economy, end quote, an imperialist sector that has subjugated the other areas of society to its will. As De Boer's phrasing might at times lead one to think, for the economy is itself constituted by value. There are, in fact, two competing views to be found in Marx, the one envisaging liberation from the economy, the other liberation by means of the economy, nor may the two be simply assigned to different phases of Marx's thought, as some would like to do. In his critique of value, Marx thoroughly exposed the, quote, pure form, end quote, of the society of the commodity. At the time, this critique constituted a bold piece of anticipation. Only today is it able truly to apprehend the essence of social reality. Marx himself was not aware, and his Marxist successors even less aware, of the gap that existed between his critique of value and the content of the greater part of his work, in which he scrutinized the empirical forms of the capitalist society of his era. He could not have perceived how laden that era still was with pre-capitalist features, and consequently many of the characteristics he described were still very different from, even sometimes opposed to, what was to emerge later from the gradual victory of the commodity form over all the relics of pre-capitalist times. Marx thus treated as essential traits of capitalism features that were in reality expressions of a still unfinished form of the system. Among such features, for example, is the creation of a class that had an, of necessity to be excluded from bourgeois society and its, quote, benefits, end quote. The Marxism of the workers' movement from social democracy to Stalinism and including all the more or less highly elaborated variants produced by the intellectuals retained only this side of, the Marx, of Marx's thought. And even if the movement often distorted it still more, it nevertheless had good reason to refer to this view of things which was valid as applied to capitalism's ascendant phase when the issue was still the imposition of capitalist forms upon pre-bourgeois forms. Footnote. The situation as to detested dogmatism and quote, isms, end quote, in general, maintained that they were Marxists. Quote, just as much as Marx was when he said, quote, I am not a Marxist, end quote, end quote. Was it Guy Debord or the Situationist that said, said something like, I'm a Groucho Marxist, or is that something else? Any hooser. And footnote. The high point of this phase was the period epitomized by the names of Ford and Keynes, a triumph when the Marxism of the workers' movement enjoyed its greatest triumph. Sumi. A high point of this phase is the period epitomized by the names of Ford and Keynes, a time when the Marxism of the workers' movement enjoyed the Marxism of the workers' movement's greatest triumphs. The crisis that erupted in the 1960s, by contrast, arose not as before from shortcomings of the commodity system, but instead from that system's total victory. And it was now that its most fundamental contradiction came to the fore, a contradiction grounded in the structure of the commodity itself. As we shall see, the relevance of de Boer's thought lies in his having hit having been among the first to interpret the present situation in light in the light of the Marxian theory of value, whereas de Boer's shakier contentions are made at points where his thinking is still under the influence of the Marxism of the workers' movement. One of the last voices of an old kind of social criticism, de Boer was at the same time one of the first voices of a new stage. There are two Im implications of the critique of commodity fetishism that de Boer had the great foresight to grasp. The first is that Economic exploitation is not the sole evil of capitalism, for capitalism necessarily entails the rejection of life itself in all life's concrete manifestations. Second, none of the many variant arrangements within the commodity economy can ever bring about decisive change. It is therefore quite fruitless to expect any good outcome to flow from the development of the economy and an adequate distribution of its benefits. 
alienation and dispossession are the very essence of the commodity economy, nor could they nor could that economy ever function on any other basis, so that whenever the money progresses, alienation and dispossession must needs likewise progress. De Boer made a genuine rediscovery here, for it must be remembered that, quote, Marxism, end quote, was no more inclined than bourgeois society to practice the, quote, critique of political economy, end quote. Instead, Marxism practiced political economy tout court, considering the abstract and quantitative sides of labor while ignoring the contradiction with its concrete side. Footnote, Marx identifies the, quote, purely economic, end quote, view with the, quote, bourgeois standpoint, end quote. This passage is also cited in Luka by Lukash in History and Class Consciousness. End footnote. This brand of Marxism failed to see that the subordination of the whole of life to economic requirements was one of the most contemptible results of capitalist development. It treated this result instead as an ontological fact and judged that bringing it to the fore was in itself a revolutionary act. De, Boer uses the ter use, De Boer's use of the term, quote, image and, quote, spectacle should be understood as an extension of Marx's idea of the commodity form. All these concepts reduce the multiplicity of the real to a unique, abstract, and equal form. And indeed, the image and the spectacle occupy the same position in De Boer's thought as the commodity and the commodity's derivatives do in Marx's. The first sentence of the Society of the Spectacle is a detournement of the first sentence of Capital, quote, The whole life of these societies in which modern conditions of production prevail presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles, end quote. Likewise, De Boer substitutes the word, quote, spectacle for the word, quote, capital, in another sentence borrowed from Marx, quote, the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather the spectacle is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images, end quote. De Boer, footnote, quote, capital volume one, quote, capital is not a thing, but a social relation between persons which is mediated through things, end quote, end footnote. According to Marx, money accumulated beyond a certain threshold is transformed into capital. According to De Boer, capital accumulated beyond a certain threshold is transformed into images. The spectacle is the equivalent. <coughs> the spectacle is the equivalent, not merely of goods as is money, but also of all possible forms of activity. The reason being precisely that quote, whatever society as a whole can be and do end quote, has been commodified. The, quote, essentially tautological, end quote, character of the spectacle perfectly echoes the tautological and self-referential character of abstract labor, of which the only goal is to increase the mass of objectified dead labor and which, in effect, treats the production of use values merely as a means of reaching that goal. Footnote. Whereas labor under its concrete aspect invariably produces a qualitative transformation, as, for instance, when cloth is transformed into a coat, no such transformation occurs under its abstract aspect, merely an increase in value. Money objectified dead labor. This is the origin of labor's tautological character. End footnote. The spectacle is conceived by De Boer as a visualization of the abstract link that exchange establishes between individuals. Just as for Marx, money was the materialization of that link, and images in their turn assume material form and exert a real influence on society. This is why De Boer insists that, quote, ideological entities have never been more fictitious, end quote. All right, that's the end of that section. That section was titled... The Spectacle, Highest Stage of Abstraction. The next section, if you're trying to listen to these chronologically, is titled De Boer and Lukash. And I don't know how I'm going to uh, put these all up on uh, YouTube, like what I'm going to use for the titles, because sometimes the titles, like the subsections, like, um, are like reference to like a, a broader theme of what the part or chapter is. And so it's a little hard sometimes if you just put up something like The Spectacle, Highest Stage of Abstraction. Um, you know, you might not know exactly uh, what it was uh, referencing to, referencing. Um, but actually, that one's pretty self forward and so straightforward, and so is De Boer and Lukash. So um, it'll work itself out. But uh, thank you for listening. Next section is De Boer and Lukash.